So, Little Joe. Now, I talked about this before because um, last year I was at the Strasbourg European Fantasy Film Festival. I know that you were... You're so travelled. I am You're so travelled. I'm, I'm, I'm a film critic. It's my job. Yes. I have to, and You know, I don't do festivals very often, but the ones I do are kind of particularly well chosen. So but The media elite. You represent the media elite. Okay. For me, as anyway. If you say so. I aspire to be where you are. Okay, so when I was at Strasbourg, I said that one of the most interesting things I saw was this film called Little Joe, and you asked me to describe it. I said it's a very, very hard film to describe. Well, now it's out in the UK, and I'm going to have to describe it. So it is, on the one hand, a uh, a sci-fi chiller, and on the other hand, it is a psychological satire. And uh, it's written, co-written and directed by Jessica Hausner, who made I'm a Fool and, Lu- and Lords. And the central story is that uh, Emily Beecham is Alice, uh, a scientist botanist who works in a lab which produces genetically engineered plants. Uh, she's uh, co-working with uh, Chris, played by Ben Wishaw, and they have developed a plant which makes its owner happy. The scent of the plant is meant to produce oxytocin, which we are told in the drama is the mother hormone. And the sort of the, the, the selling point of the plant is you will love this plant in the same way that you would love a child. You would love it as your own child. The plant is being rushed to market because there is a flower fair that is coming up very soon. And there is an indication that somehow in, in the creation of the plant, its rushing has meant that certain boundaries have been crossed in order to get it ready in time. However, the main thing that's happened is that it has taken our central character away from her own son. She has a son called Joe, who she has basically been neglecting because she has been at work, or at least she thinks she's been neglecting him and he thinks that she's been neglecting him. So one day, and completely against protocol, she decides to bring home one of the plants for him. Look what I have for you. Oh. Is that allowed? I mean, no one has to know. Do you like it? Yeah. It's really hot in here. Yes, it needs to be warm. This is a very special breed. You have to take good care of it. Keep it warm. Talk to it. Really? It's a living being. It needs attention and affection. What's so special about it? It makes you happy. What do you say we call him Little Joe? Hi, Little Joe. I love the way she says that when he says, what's special about it? It makes you happy. Which, when I hear that, I hear, I don't think you're going to go to London. It sounds sinister. So then what happens is that uh, Kerry Fox, who is her co-worker, is called Bella, is somebody that we learn has a history of, um, you know, uh, mental illness, suddenly starts to think that her dog, with whom she is obsessed and who is called Bello, is not her dog. In fact, she says, that's not my bellow. That dog is not my dog. Now, this obviously starts ringing alarm bells because it's body snatchers, you know. My uncle is not my uncle. My neighbour is not my neighbour. And at first, everybody thinks that she's just being weird and being paranoid. But meanwhile, our central character, played by Emily Beecham, starts to think that maybe there is something going on because she's discovered that her son... She feels like she doesn't know him anymore. And her co-worker says, well, of course you don't. He's a, he's a young boy. He's changing. He's growing up. Her estranged partner, the father of their child, says, yeah, you know, he's not the boy he used to be. But that's a perfectly natural thing. And then we hear Ben Wishaw's character say that Gary Fox's character, well, ever since she's been on the medication, she's a different person. So there's this whole thing in the air about people changing. Meanwhile, there is a psychiatrist, there are scenes of a psychiatrist, in which our central character goes to talk about the things that are worrying her. And she starts to talk about the fact that she has this anxiety that maybe something is going on with the plant. Maybe the plant is affecting people. And her psychiatrist sort of gets her to say, well, you know, is this to do with your own anxieties about your work-life balance? The fact that, you know, you're calling the plant Little Joe when your actual son is called Joe... Um, is it that you feel that you're torn between your two children, the one that you've created at work, the one that you've created at home? So all these things are going on around this kind of 
science fiction inflected story about a plant which creates this strange scent which may actually affect or infect those who inhale it. So you immediately start thinking, I mentioned body snatchers before. I think there is, again, a, a, a lot of John Wyndham in this. You think of um, Day of the Triffids or, you know, Little Shop of Horrors, the stories of, you know, plants rebelling in strange ways. But actually, crucially, the thing that makes the drama work is that all of it could be read psychologically. And because the film keeps revealing itself as a something which can be argued away, you can read it one or two. Now, I've seen the film a couple of times. The first time I saw it, I felt very strongly that it was one particular strand of a story. The second time I saw it, I thought it was, it was the other strand. The way in which it's constructed, I mean, visually, it's extraordinary. The whole thing has a kind of almost Kubrickian symmetry to the uh, the choreography of shots, cameras moving, gliding very, very slowly, everything in the frame looking like it's been put there really, really carefully, very specifically colour-coded, that kind of the bland green of the background with splashes of red and a flash of yellow and a very, very sort of clear blue flower in the middle of uh, of this picture. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about the film is if you watched it with the sound down and not hearing the dialogue, you could actually start to read the story because of the way the colour scheme works. I mean, you know, cinema is a visual medium and it is a film which tells its story through its production design, through its costume design, and indeed through the perfect marriage of its costume and, uh, costume and, and, uh, and production design. Also, the use of uh, music by Tejito, which is incredibly, um, you know, obviously it takes us back to Maiderin, but more importantly, the, the music works in a way which is deeply unsettling, deeply creepy, like it's kind of plucking at the edges of reality. You hear a kind of um, a wind instrument which seems to be blowing the pollen of the plant around, but you hear these other kind of scratching, barking, aggressive sounds as if they're kind of literally picking at the seams of reality. Now, I know that it's not a film that is for everybody. I know this particularly since at least one member of the production, Joe, uh, feels very differently to it to, uh, about it than I do. But I think it's really terrific. I think that, yes, it has an iciness that some people may see as emotionally unengaging. And yes, the whole thing has a theatrical quality. As I think you heard from that clip, you know, the, the gaps between the words are very, very precise. But I found it really, really got under my skin because what I loved about it, in the same way as, I mean, I feel this is true of Parasite and I feel this is true of Lighthouse, the films that work the best for me are films in which it's not a matter of tying everything up and, you know, sorting all the questions out. It's a matter of, of you know, which, which way are you reading this? And I think you'd really like Little Joe because you can see it as com completely not a science fiction movie in any way, shape or form. You can see it, if you want, as a story about parental guilt. You can see it as a story about the worries of genetic modification. You can see it as a fairy tale in which there is a central character with red hair moving through a green environment in which these kind of, you know, there are m magical plants. Or you can see it as a satire on the way in which the modern commodification of plants, you know, leads you to create plants that can't reproduce. Why? Well, because genetically modified plants aren't supposed to reproduce, but also because you can charge more for them if they can't. I thought all those things were going on in Little Joe, and I was fascinated by it, and I really liked it.